Hello, it's Randy Rhodes. Here's a clip from our show and go to randyrhodes.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast. Mary had a little man, man, man. The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. A radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Okay. Knock, knock. Who's there? It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your mind. It's Friday, you bastard. Especially you, Michael. It's Michael's birthday. I know this because his wife, Dawn, called. Happy birthday, Michael. This is your present. I swear to God, she's a cheap bitch. You know what she gave him for his birthday? A shout out from me. Dawn. That's what I said. His wife, Don. Yes. No? Oh, Don's a man. Is Don a man? I talked to Don. I talked to Don myself. Wow. Okay. Well, you never can tell these days. <laughs> well, happy birthday to Michael from Don. Don got you for your birthday a shout out from me. Wow. <laughs> That's woo power to the people, the little people. Yeah, and speaking of power to the little people, oh my God. So the president, uh, by, oh well, here's the thing. If you don't read anything else today, so why I want to say this really up front for people with very short attention spans. Uh, if you don't read anything today, then you need to read one article in the Washington Post. Oh, my freaking God. It will take you almost all weekend to read it because it's 22 printed out pages. That's what it is. Of course, I print it with a larger font than most because I'm blind. I just don't see very well. Uh, never did. But and that's why I'm not a pilot. Uh, but or I would have been. But I think you really need to read this Washington Post article. It is the most amazing 22-page spy novel you have ever read in your life. It's called Obama's Secret Struggle to Punish Russia for Putin's Election Assault. <gasps> it is unbelievable. Wow. So what does it say? Well, it pretty much says that the Russia uh, infiltration into voter registration rolls, into the software systems that uh, were put in touchscreen voting machines, into uh, the DNC, the RNC, other political, that it's not a hoax, Donald, okay? It's just not a hoax. Sorry, dude, that Russia thing is not a hoax. It's real, and our whole government was trying to respond to it, and they didn't say anything to the public because they had one candidate out there that was saying a rigged system rigged 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 to rig the system rigged the system totally rigged rigged press totally totally rigged rigged system. System. the election is going to be rigged we're running against a rigged press we're running against dishonest people okay really dishonest people. no it's not okay i don't even really know where to start on answering this question uh of course the elections will not be rigged what does that mean well he knew what it meant but he had already taken steps, see. They found out in late August, according to this article, they found out in late August that there were um, infiltrations into at least 21 states, uh, voting registration rolls, uh, that there was a, a, a hack into uh, software systems developed in Florida that go into the machines. And, that, I mean, they found out all this stuff in, like, late August, in late August. And... Obama was struggling with how do I tell the American people or do I tell them at all? And he was also struggling with the fact that if he told uh, the American people, not only because Donald Trump was running around saying it was rigged. Now, why was Donald Trump running around saying it was rigged? Because Donald Trump knew who was rigging it, apparently. He knew exactly what was going on as much as Obama did. Otherwise, why would you have a candidate who, if he won on the back end of his big win, would have to say it wasn't rigged? You see, what I, I mean, he's such a freaking liar. It, it, it's so amazing. But anyway, they knew that there was this uh, covert cyber operation. And according to this article in The Washington Post, Putin himself ordered it, which is what the testimony was. Uh, when we finally had hearings about the uh, Russian hacks, the operation was still in its very early stages in uh, uh, when uh, Obama actually took action. And so what he did was covert action. He didn't talk to the American people about it because he didn't want to reveal a sources and methods, which was, pr you know, the, 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 the main thing on his mind. Don't reveal sources and methods. Don't tip off uh, the Russians about, you know, this because people would say, well, how did you get this information and what are you doing about it? 
And what he had done about it was something very covert. They deployed what they call implants, like these. Okay, well, these are real. Who would choose this? You people are crazy. The girls that choose this, this giant thing, wrong. Wrong. If I, if I could spend money uh, on one thing, uh, you know, cosmetically, it would be to make them smaller. Anyway, we did implants. It's some, the American way. They deployed implants into Russian networks. Networks that would, if triggered, cause the Russians a lot of pain. I don't know exactly what that means, but, you know, when you think about some of the viruses that we've released to stop the Iranian nuclear centrifuges, that Stuxnet virus, you know, you kind of got to think maybe a lot, but we don't know. We just don't know. But the U.S. intelligence agencies were given the opportunity to plant little bombs, if you will, into Russian networks so that if, and then Obama called, remember he called Vladimir Putin personally in September? He did. He called Vlad and he said, cut the crap. And people said, that's not a strong enough response. That's because there was another response, which didn't I say, I'm sure there's something else going on that you're not privy to. I'm sure this isn't just a bunch of yammering. I just don't think that he wants to be accused of A, revealing sources and methods, and a B, I don't think he wants to be accused of interfering in the election because by that time he had come out and started campaigning for uh, his successor in the party who would be, you know, <laughs> Hillary. So. Uh, but the U.S. intelligence agencies were prepared and they had uh, they did not need any further approval to uh, pull the trigger on any of these bombs. The implants were developed by the National Security Agency and they were designed to hit Russian networks that were deemed, quote, important to the adversary that would cause them pain and discomfort if they were disrupted. And they could be activated in the event that Russia attacked a power grid or interfered any further in the presidential election. Now, the feeling is that the interfering stopped after September, that anything that was going to be done was already done by the Russians. The Washington Post said it did come from the highest levels in the Russian government and did say it came from Putin himself, which was what the previous testimony was from the intelligence communities when they said, yes, there is an investigation. And yes, it was ordered at the highest levels. Yes, the highest levels mean Vladimir Putin. CIA Director John Brennan said he first alerted the White House in August and that Putin himself had ordered the operation and the operation was to defeat Hillary Clinton, or if she still prevailed, to damage her presidency and elect her opponent as the first uh, priority, first uh, the first preference of the Russians, Donald Trump. That message was sent by courier. They didn't even they didn't even bother to put that in in, in an email or in writing. They sent a courier, a secure, uh, a secret courier from the CIA carried it to the Obama White House, marked it eyes only, and that the contents could only be shared with four people, Obama and three of his senior aides. And the officials uh, then started to debate their response, and they start, They wanted. They knew they had to protect the secrecy and the security, and the, the lengths to which they went was amazing. Uh, what we did learn here is that the Gang of Eight was briefed in the Senate, just like, uh, you know, in the Senate and the House, the intelligence committees, and that they never leaked it. They never told anybody. And trust me, the Gang of Eight is, is bipartisan, right? You have ranking, which, you know, is uh, Democrats, and you have uh, chairmen, which are Republicans. And uh, they never told the public anything. They never leaked anything. And of course, if, if you were a Democrat, I, I, the temptation must have been awesome. Awesome. But nobody did. But on the 15th of August, the Homeland Security Secretary, Jay Johnson, arranged a conference call with dozens of state officials he called all the state this is what he testified to this week nobody paid attention because you don't know how to say j just call him j it could be wrong it's j e h j j j like jebediah like that right j anyway that's what he testified to this week that he was calling every state and he was trying to explain to them that uh, we need your support. You have to designate uh, your voting systems as critical infrastructure and protect it. You have to give priority to the voting machines. We are offering you federal cybersecurity assistance. He said he ran into a wall of resistance 
from Republican governors who said that the federal government does not make the decisions about how the states, the manner in which the states select their electors, and that the feds should stay out of it unless, of course, it comes down to a tie. And then in that case, the Supreme Court will pick our next president. <laughs> but the state, they said Georgia's secretary of state. Remember I told you? I told you. Karen Handel's just, she was also a secretary of state in Georgia. Georgia's secretary of state stood out as the worst of the worst because he was unconvinced of Russian interference. And he said, states' rights, trump the feds. We don't want any of your stinking help. And he couldn't get any GOP states to take the federal cyber security assistance that was being offered to them to protect their state's voters. It's amazing. And uh, the White House, in the end, decided not to tell the American people because, as Jay Johnson testified this week, one candidate was screaming rigged. For a commercial-free, on-demand, whenever, wherever listening experience, visit randyrhodes.com for your personal premium podcast today. Hey, do you own gold? You know, if you don't, you're in a bad position. Stocks are at an all-time high. Gold at recent lows. So maybe to you it seems like things are going great, but I can assure you if another stock market crash comes, if another 2008 happens, are you protected? I don't think so. Don't wait until after something bad happens because then stocks fall and gold goes up. Get gold now while it's low and diversify your portfolio today. Because once you have gold in your portfolio, you can rest assured you are protected. So call my friends at ITM Trading at one triple eight own gold They're experts at diversifying investment portfolios with precious metals. They can help you in building a custom strategy based on your goals, your objectives. Please don't follow the herd and don't wait till it's too late. Take action today and bring safety to your financial future. Call ITM Trading today at one triple eight own gold and speak to a precious metals expert and ask for a free gold kit. one triple eight own gold one triple eight O W N G O L D. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1947. That was the day the despised Taft-Hartley Act became law. It was a direct retaliatory response to the 1946 post-war strike wave where millions walked off the job after waiting years for basic demands. The labor movement mobilized against the slave labor bill through numerous rallies. The AFL joined the CIO in threatening 24-hour strikes across whole industries in protest as the bill wound its way through Congress. 11,000 soft coal miners in Pennsylvania walked out in a spontaneous protest strike earlier in the month. The bill passed over the veto of President Harry S. Truman, who would invoke it a dozen times over the course of his presidency. Many union leaders hailed Truman as a friend of labor for his 11th hour veto. Labor Party advocates were incensed that of the 219 congressional Democrats, 126 voted in favor of the bill. Practically overnight, the labor movement had been pushed back 25 years. Taft-Hartley was nothing short of disastrous for the American labor movement. With the stroke of a pen, the act criminalized many of the actions key to historic union victories in the 30s and 40s. Jurisdictional strikes, secondary boycotts, solidarity strikes, closed shops, and mass picketing were just a few of the most basic trade union activities now outlawed. The act helped fire the first shots of the McCarthy Red Scare by mandating that union officers file non-communist affidavits with the government, which was later found to be unconstitutional. The act also provided the ammunition needed to strangle strikes by empowering the president to easily acquire strike-breaking injunctions and it allowed for the rapid growth of right-to-work laws at the state level. And because of Taft-Hartley, the union movement has suffered ever since. All Things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. I, I was going to fire Comey. Uh, I, there's no good time to do it, by the way. Uh, they, because in your letter they you said I, I accepted, accepted their recommendations. Yeah, well, they so you also, had already made the decision. I, oh, I was going to fire regardless of recommendations. So there was a room. He made a recommendation. He's highly respected. 
very good guy, very smart guy. Uh, the Democrats like him, the Republicans like him. Uh, he made a recommendation, but regardless of recommendation, I was going to fire Comey, knowing there was no good time to do it. And in fact, when I decided to just do it, I said to myself, I said, you know, this Russia thing with Trump and Russia is a made up story. It's an excuse by the Democrats for having lost an election that they should have won. And the reason they should have won it is the Electoral College is almost impossible for a Republican to win. It's very hard because you start off at such a disadvantage. Really? So everybody was thinking they should have won the election. This was an excuse for having lost an election. Okay. He's such a he's such a freaking uh, let's just call him a non protector of the United States and our critical infrastructure. I mean, I've never seen a president deny uh, that we were attacked because it makes him look less shiny or less legitimate or less uh, pure uh, in his election. I've never nobody's ever heard of somebody like that. That becomes the president of the United States swears an oath to protect and defend uh, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and then calls an attack uh, on the United States a hoax because it, it would reflect badly on his giant win, you know, the biggest uh, win ever, which is totally untrue totally completely and the idea that the whole map wasn't red when nixon won is a ridiculous notion i mean he just keeps lying but this this article in the washington post lays out everything that russia was doing and you've got a president currently who doesn't care about our security he just i've never in my life seen anything like it and one constant factor was how to respond uh, you know, to this hack publicly because of him. Because, listen, there's no way that he could have said, you know, uh, that he would have picked this country. But it would be interesting to see. I, I will tell you this. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. I think you will probably be rewarded mightily by our press. Now, why, if he didn't believe that Russia was the source of the WikiLeaks document, which he loved, he loved WikiLeaks, I love WikiLeaks, I love it. But why, if he didn't believe that Russia was a source for hacking and getting information, emails, whatever, why would he say Russia if you're listening? Obviously, he believed it then. What he just doesn't believe it now. And if he believed it then, then that gives cre you know credibility to why he was running around saying, "I know it's rigged. I know it is." And that's because he knew what Russia was doing. And what's really interesting is the intelligence agencies and the Gang of Eight were the only ones that knew because we weren't told. We weren't told because he was out there saying the whole system was rigged. Now, Jay Johnson, you know, when he uh, 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 testified this week, he says, you know, this is the reason why uh, they didn't make this public. In the late summer of last year, it became apparent that the Russians were doing more than uh, gathering foreign intelligence, that they were, in fact, dumping it in a way designed to potentially influence outcomes, not by affecting the vote machines necessarily, but by affecting American public opinion with the dumping of these emails. Mm -hmm. So that's happening in late summer, uh, mid to late summer. Why did it take the administration so long to make a public statement that a foreign adversary was trying to influence the American election? The statement didn't come until October. Uh, why did we wait from July till October to make that statement? Well, Congressman, I'm going to disagree with your premise that there was some type of delay. Um, this was a big decision, and there were a lot of considerations that went into it. Uh, this was an unprecedented step. Um, first, as you know well, uh, we have to carefully consider whether declassifying the information compromises sources and methods. Second, there was an ongoing election, and many would criticize us for perhaps taking sides in the election. So that had to be carefully considered. One of the candidates, as you recall, was predicting that the election was going to be rigged in some way. And so we were concerned that by making the statement, we might in and of itself be um, uh, challenging the integrity of the, of the election process uh, itself. Uh, A rigged system. Rigged, rigged, rigged. To rig the system. Rigged. Get it? 
So this is why they felt that they couldn't insert themselves. And 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 Donald Trump is just that kind of a person. You know, this whole thing about, uh, you know, now, uh, you know, telling people that, um, you know, I don't know, maybe we need to fire Mueller. I, you know, I'll give him a little more time and, and Comey better hope there are no tapes. And of course, there are no tapes. Everybody's saying that what what's going on is that Donald Trump thinks of, uh, uh, of the way he governs or thinks of, you know, being president as one big game, like The Apprentice or like poker. And he He's bluffing like a lawyer's trick where, you know, the lawyer shows up uh, on the other side, you know, and uh, they put like a little box on the desk and uh, they keep like looking at the box like there's something in the box that would, you know, make everything that you're testifying to a complete lie. And really, the box is empty and it's just a stupid lawyer's trick to make you nervous that you better watch it. This is what Donald Trump is saying he did to call me. That's witness intimidation. And the president of the United States does this all the time. He to Sally Yates, remember, uh, you know, right before Sally Yates testified that, uh, you know, sh- that she had gone to the White House and that she personally told uh, 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 J- uh, the White House that uh, 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 Michael Flynn was blackmailable. She told the White House counsel, Don McGahn, personally, not on the phone. You know, they were all running to the White House telling everybody everything. And she uh, she said, uh, listen, Don, uh, we have evidence that uh, Michael Flynn has engaged in some behaviors. She won't say what they were. But uh, she said to Don McGahn what they were, showed him the evidence and said he's now blackmailable by the Russians. And you really ought to be careful about letting him attend uh, security briefings, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, th- th- Trump let Flynn after he was warned that Flynn was an agent uh, and that was accepting money from foreign governments. Now we know it wasn't just Russia. It wasn't just Turkey. This week it broke that he's also he was also involved in a nuclear reactor deal in, in, uh, uh, in, in Saudi Arabia on behalf of Russia. I mean, this is like and so. Right before she testified, you remember Trump tweeted and his tweets speak for themselves in their official White House documents, according to Sean Spicer, on Tuesdays, but not Wednesdays. And then Thursdays, maybe, because they didn't have the discussion, whatever. But he tweeted, the president did, ask Sally Yates about the uh, illegal unmasking or some trying to intimidate her. Now, unmasking for the intelligence community is completely legal and allowable as long as you don't leak the name of the person to people without clearances to know the name of a person. But if you're following a, um, you know, a, 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 a dialogue or if you're following a, a, a plot and it says, you know, the way you'll get the intelligence, it'll only say American number one, American number two, Russian number one. Or maybe they'll tell you the foreign names, but they won't tell you the Americans' names so that if you can't follow the story, you can make an official request in writing to the intelligence, uh, um, part, to, to the, the part of the intelligence uh, apparatus, let's call it, that is responsible for collecting. So let's say it's uh, the NSA because it's, you know, a phone call. It's an intercepted phone call. <clears throat> so then you can write to the NSA and you can say, all right, I'm listening to this, but I can't follow, you know, who is speaking or what. The-. And so they will then have a meeting or two or three and decide whether or not it's it's okay for the national security advisor to the president to know the identity of an american citizen and it's classified and you can never say it out loud to the american people you can never say it out loud to anybody who doesn't have a clear but that is completely legal so i don't know the president made that the issue to distract you from the fact that he was out there saying the whole thing was going to be rigged and that it was rigged and he knew it was rigged and russia If you're listening, get me some more information. But now all of a sudden he's pulling the babe in the woods routine and saying, well, you know, um, you know, about the tweets. He's saying, well, I, I wanted to keep Comey honest because you're so damn honest, right? You have to make sure that Comey, who's a freaking he's my boyfriend, for God's sake. And he's a boy scout. You were you were threatening. That's witness intimidation. It is illegal. And the president admitted it on Fox and Friends this morning that he did it. Well, I didn't tape him. Uh, You never know what's happening when you see that the Obama administration and perhaps longer than that was doing all of this unmasking and uh, surveillance. And you read all about it. And I've been reading about it for the last couple of months about the seriousness of the and horrible situation with surveillance all over the place. And you've been hearing the word unmasking, a, a word you probably never heard before. So you never know what's out there. But I didn't tape and I don't have any tape and I didn't tape. 
But when he found out that uh, I, you know, that there may be tapes out there, whether it's governmental tapes or anything else, and who knows, uh, I think you should his story know. may have changed. I mean, you'll have to take a look at that because then he has to tell what actually took place at the events. And my story didn't change. My story was always a straight story. My story was always the truth. But you'll have to determine for yourself whether or not his story changed. But uh, I did not take it. was a smart way to make sure he stayed honest in those hearings. Well, uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't very stupid, I can tell you that. He, was, he f did admit that what I said was right. And if you look further back before he heard about that, I think maybe he wasn't admitting that. So you'll have to do a little investigative reporting to determine that. But I don't think it'll be that hard. Wow. The balls of him is just insane. My story never changed. In his interview with Lester Holt on NBC, the president said, I had dinner with him. He wanted to have dinner because he wanted to stay on. Is this an accurate statement? No, sir. Did you in any way initiate that dinner? No. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on, right? Because he explains how he had a date with his wife and how to cancel because the president. I mean, nothing that the president said was true to Lester Holt. Nothing. But he does somehow sabotage himself when he says stupid things like, I was going to fire him anyway because of the Russia thing. I was going to fire him anyway. You know, and, and he says stupid things like, uh, you know, uh, I, ha I didn't have tapes. I, I just wanted to keep him on. I mean. What? He's admitting witness intimidation. I told you that Lester Holt interview was uh, Trump's kryptonite because he can't help himself. He's a man child. He just <clears throat> but, you know, of course, we knew there were no tapes. I tweeted it the day he said, you know, that there was this press conference and they said, you know, I'll let you know in due time. I'll let you know 41 days ago, 42 days ago now. I'll let you know. I tweeted that night. There are no tapes. OK, because he would have to be an absolute moron to tape his conversations with his own group in the White House which is the only indication it might have happened. It is something he would be dumb enough to do, it, it, you know, but that doesn't mean he did it. It just means he's dumb enough to say he did it anyway. And then dumb enough to go on TV and say, I didn't do it, even though I said I did. You know, <clears throat> and this, this admission that there are no tapes, everybody that looked at it agrees that his lawyers wrote it because it was correctly, um, the grammar was correct, the punctuation was accurate, and the spelling was good. So they said, oh, it's his lawyers did it. Because, uh, you know, th and they're probably telling him you have to come clean, and he probably agreed to come in clean if he could tell another lie also. So now you've got Kellyanne Conway, uh, you know, muddying up the waters Yes, uh, this morning, actually. I mean, it, it's so ridiculous how this goes. Why Regulations didn't the, the president stock market and the confidence numbers love answer it? definitively about whether there were audio tapes? He answered definitively yesterday that he has right. not made such tapes. He doesn't have sooner? such tapes, but there could be. <laughs> there could be. There could be. And that's what I said to you. I, I told you that this thing was so legal. It, it was so, it, it was such a wordsmithed tweet that you knew a trump didn't send it and uh, b that lawyers did and so the the, the lawyers are like uh you know put the commas in the right and, and they said oh well with all the unmasking and all they're going back to the original lie that obama wiretapped him spelled wrong right i mean th nothing he says is true it's just unfreaking believable you know and so now he's saying things like uh well, you know, Mueller, I, I, I'll give him a little more time, but I don't trust him because the people he's hiring have made. Now, check this out, because the debunk on this is so fun. But that the people that Mueller is hiring have made donations to Hillary Clinton. Robert Mueller, do you think he should recuse himself from this? Because he is good friends with James Comey. He's hired some, some attorneys that were part of Hillary Clinton's foundation and given money to President Obama and Hillary Clinton's campaign. Should he recuse himself? Well, he's very, very good friends with uh, Comey, uh, which is very bothersome. Uh, but he's also, uh, we're going to have to see. I mean, we're going to have to see in terms, look, there has been no obstruction. There has been no collusion. <laughs> I wouldn't go there. There has been leaking by Comey. Oh. But there's been no collusion, no obstruction, and virtually everybody agrees to that. No. So we'll have to see. No one um, does. I can say that the people that have been hired are all Hillary Clinton supporters. Some of them worked for Hillary Clinton. I mean, the whole thing is ridiculous, if you want to know the truth from that standpoint. But uh, Robert Mueller's an honorable man. 
and hopefully he'll come up with an honorable solution. I hope he does. I hope you can let this go. I hope you... All right, so here's the... Here's the fun debunk. This is really fun. Okay, so Donald Trump has given Hillary Clinton donations as well as Donald Trump Jr. in 2002, 2005, 2006, 2007, and a $100,000 donation to the Clinton Foundation. He also invited Hillary and Bill, as you well know, uh, to his wedding with Melania, who was standing there letting him lie. She just stands there like some silent, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, like a photograph, you know, she's not even like real. And she knows that Hillary and Bill were invited to their wedding. There were photos all over the Internet with them together. Uh, and it was at Mar-a-Lago, and uh, that wasn't the only Democratic beneficiary of Trump's wealth. Trump gave $5,000 to the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee. Trump gave $20,000 to the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee in the 2006 election cycle. Uh, he also helped Harry Reid financially, Nancy Pelosi. Oh, I thought she's poison to the Republicans. Donald Trump helped her. Helped her financially. And in 2006, when he was giving all this money to the Harry Reeds, to the Nancy Pelosi's, to the Democratic Congressional Campaign, to the Democratic Senatorial Campaign, he only gave $1,000. Only $1,000 to the National Republican Senatorial Campaign. Only $1,000. Can he ever... A man is just congenitally unable to tell the truth. It's like, it's no fun for him. The truth doesn't have any give and take to it. You know, it's so definite. And, of course, the truth is hard to hear, and he's not into, you know, anything hard. You could tell by Melania's expression when she looks at him. To speak to Randy, call now, you bastards. 561-270-3844. Hello? Hello? The Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Air Force. We're back, and everything is possible again. Isn't it beautiful? Well, if you want to keep it this way, buy a stinking podcast. Oh, yes, you have to buy a stinking podcast. And you get that at randyroads.com, where we're open all day, all night long. randyroads.com. Get your stinking podcast. You're listening to Win Workers Independent News, a diversified media enterprises production. I'm Doug Cunningham. The Senate Republican health care bill cuts hundreds of billions of dollars from Medicaid while ending Obamacare taxes on the wealthy, on medical devices, prescription drugs, and indoor tanning. Poor people lose coverage and face higher costs, while rich people and corporations benefit under the GOP plan. U.S. Senator Martin Heinrich. Republicans want to slash hundreds of billions, that's billions with a B, of dollars from Medicaid and destroy the program as it currently exists. Our health care system represents about one-sixth of this nation's economy, and it supports millions of jobs. Republicans have taken a go-it-alone approach that will significantly impact the nation's economy without holding one hearing. Republicans decided to keep the tax on your health care plan through your employer starting in 2026. Older Americans will see their premiums drastically increase. The GOP health bill will increase your out-of-pocket health care costs by eliminating the Obamacare subsidies. Large employers would no longer be required to offer affordable health insurance. Democrats call the Senate version even meaner than the House version. Bottom line is that under the Republican health care bill, tens of millions of people will lose coverage so that tax cuts can be given to the rich. Costs will go way up for the most vulnerable, like older Americans, and some people with pre-existing conditions, and health insurance coverage standards will be degraded. Compared to Obamacare, Americans will get less coverage at a higher cost. No contract! No No contract! No 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 14,000 UPTE CWA members negotiating a new labor contract with the University of California say the university is attacking their pensions. 
Yelger Kalman is president of UPTE CWA. They are trying to undermine our defined benefit plan by having all new employees opt out of it and just receive a retirement savings plan. In essence, they're having Wall Street steal about half the pension savings for those new employees because it'll be put into a savings plan, which yields about half the result once you actually retire. UPTCWA considers that effort to just arbitrarily end the pensions to be bad faith bargaining. Coleman says his members do important research, and this battle with the University of California system is about much more than just pensions and benefits for these university workers. What we're doing when we're bargaining, it's not only about a dollar for me or a pension for, for me. This is about really the framework of public service and how we're going to be able to provide public service for our citizens, in our case in California. You want to find cures to cancer? You've got to keep cancer researchers employed. You've got to provide the conditions under which they can actually stay and afford to live where they work. That's what this is about. You've been listening to WIN, Workers Independent News. For more information, visit workersindependentnews.com. Hi, I'm Mark Levine. I host the Inside Scoop from Washington every Monday and Wednesday. You can hear me 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern on the Progressive Voices Network. Right now, very, very few people in the United States Senate are working on a bill to overhaul the American health care system. And they refuse to let us know what's in it. These secrets are kept closer to the vest than, well, anything the FBI is doing in the Russia investigation. They're not leaking. Why aren't they telling us? This is supposed to be legislation, unlike, I don't know, national secrets. Legislation is supposed to be out in front. The American people are supposed to know what's going on. It's going to affect all of our lives. Every single person listening to my voice, it will affect your life. Indeed, it will likely kill tens of thousands of Americans. Talk about death panels. Sarah Palin was wrong. Trump care will kill you if it's done like the House Trump care bill was done. Get the inside scoop with me, Mark Levine, every Monday and Wednesday from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern on the Progressive Voices Network. The Randy Roach Show is brought to you by our partners at ITM Trading. Call them at one own gold and ask for a free gold kit. one o w n g o l d The Randy Rhodes Show is live on RandyRhodes.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. On to another topic, topic of the age, Comey tapes. We know they don't exist now. Um, Democrats say the president was trying to intimidate James Comey. Was that the intent a month ago? Suggesting quite the was opposite. Recording? <laughs> no, uh, quite the opposite. I think the president made it very clear that he wanted the truth to come out. He wanted everyone to be honest about this, and he wanted to get to the bottom of it. And I think he succeeded in doing that. Uh, the reality is, is that um, he wanted to make sure that the truth came out. And the by truth. talking about something like tapes, made people have to, th- made Comey in particular, think to himself, I better be honest. I better tell the truth uh, about the circumstances reg- regarding the situation. As you heard, the president said that on uh, Director Comey's watch three times, he was told he wasn't under investigation. That turned out to be true. Despite the false reporting that had come out that said Comey was going to do it, uh, he came and testified under oath that, in fact, he did do exactly as the president had said so. He had been honest the, and, and told the president on three separate occasions that he was an investigation. And what we know now is that he, there, he wasn't, there was no collusion uh, and that the only person who actually leaked was, in fact, Director Comey. Okay. All right. So Comey was uh, forced to be honest because this was Donald Trump's strategy. I got to tell you, I don't think Donald Trump has a strategy. I think what Donald Trump has is symptoms. Okay, (laughs) this is what I think. But if Comey was kept honest because Donald Trump's uh, strategy worked, then I guess that when he said this, it was honest as well. All in one dinner, the president raised your job prospects. He asked for your loyalty and denied allegations against him. All took place over one supper. Now, you told Senator Warner that the president was looking to, quote, get something. Looking back, did that dinner suggest that your job might be contingent on how you handled the investigation? I don't know that I'd go that far. I I got the sense my job would be contingent upon how he felt I, <clears throat> excuse me, how he felt I conducted myself and whether I demonstrated loyalty. But I don't know whether I go so far as to connect it to he the investigation. said the president was trying to create some sort of patronage relationship. In a patronage relationship, isn't the underling 
expected to behave in a manner consistent with the wishes of the boss? Yes. Okay. Or at least Thank consider how what you're doing will affect the boss the as a asked significant you consideration. Sorry, that and was me. Again, also, you've testified that the, the president asked you repeatedly to be loyal to him, and you responded you would be honestly loyal, which is, I think, your way of saying, I'll be honest and I'll be the head of the FBI and independent. Is that fair? Correct. I tried honest first, uh, and also, I mean, I, you see it in my testimony, I also tried to explain to him why it's in his interest and every president's interest for the FBI to be a part in a way because its credibility is important uh, to a president and to the country. And so I tried to hold the line, hold the line. It got very awkward. And I then said, uh, you'll always have honesty from me. He said, honest loyalty. And then I acceded to that as a way to end this awkwardness. At the culmination of all these events, you're summarily fired without any explanation or anything else. But well, there was an explanation. I just don't buy it. <laughs> so... Was he so? So Comey was kept honest because the president had a strategy, which really looks like a symptom of somebody who can't stop lying, you know, pathological or some sort of thing. Uh, but if Comey was kept honest by this strategy, then that was honest too. And what was also honest is that when Comey testified, now remember, only one person has been under oath, and it's only Comey. The president has never been under oath. He wasn't under oath on Fox and Friends this morning. Uh, and he requested that little uh, blonde girl to be the one. I, I don't even know who she is because I refuse. Uh, that's why I hired Scott, you know, because Scott knows me since, uh, you know, he's 15 years old. And uh, he knows that Fox News is not allowed on in my house. But he uh, volunteered for a price, for a price, to uh, watch Fox News in the morning for me and record it. <laughs> to keep my uh, Fox virginity is what it is. And I love him for it. But uh, I mean, honest to God, man, it, it, it was was Comey kept honest when he said that the president demanded loyalty? Was Comey kept honest when he said that he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, brought to the White House? Uh, and in one dinner, he said, I hope you could let that Flynn thing go. Was that honest? Was it? Was it honest? I hope this is the president speaking. I hope you can see your way clear to letting this go, to letting Flynn go. He is a good guy. I hope. You can let this go. Now, those are his exact words. Is that correct? Correct. And you wrote them here and you put them in quotes. Correct. Okay. Um, thank you for that. He You're did welcome. not direct you to let it go. Not in his words, no. He did not order you to let it go. Again, those words are not an order. No. He said, I hope. Now, like me, you probably did hundreds of cases, maybe thousands of cases, charging people with criminal offenses. And of course, you have knowledge of the thousands of cases out there that uh, where people have been charged. Do you know of any case where a person has been charged for obstruction of justice, or for that matter, any other criminal offense, where this they said or thought they hoped for an outcome? I don't know well enough to answer. And the reason I keep saying his words is, I took it as a direction. Right. I mean, this is the President of the United States, with me alone, saying, I hope this. I took it as, this is what he wants me to do. Now, I didn't, I didn't obey that, but that's the way I took it. Seriously. And then, you know, you have Donald Trump Jr. get on the uh, TV with Jeanine Pirro. In a, in a, in a I like the neckline on the purple dress. I still remember it. It was very memorable, Jeanine. Uh, and she says to Donald Trump Jr., you know, what do you think that meant? And he said, when my father says that you're an employee of his and that he hopes you do something, there's no ambiguity about it. He means you work for me, get it done. And that's how Comey also represented that. Now, was Donald Trump keeping Comey honest? <laughs> you know, Donald Trump is like that kid. You remember the Twilight Zone episode where, uh, you know, I think it was Billy Mummy, where he kept sending uh, all the people to the cornfield? That's Donald Trump. Keeps sending people to the cornfield is what it is, you know? And they're afraid he's going to, you know, he's going to say, you're a bad man. You're a bad, bad man. <laughs> he's just, he's, it's not a strategy. Just remember, it's a symptom. Nick in Mississippi. Hi, how are you? Hey, how are you? I'm doing good. Uh, just drying out my socks here, you know, because we had like two inches of rain so far from Cindy. Oh, how's it going? Yeah. Uh, well, it stopped raining now, so 
I don't see any houses floating, so I think that's a good sign. That's a good sign. I'm in Florida. I know just what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, now, I want to cash your mind back to last fall. I don't know if you remember it or, or caught it, but MSNBC ran a very odd story, which I thought was odd at the time. And the story was Putin had ordered all of the uh, Russian computers, intelligence computers, uh, switched from Windows. Matter of fact, then they got rid of the Windows computers and got uh, computers with uh, the Russian uh, operating system. Do you recall that? No. No, well, I remember it. I remember it. And it was about September, October. And I thought about that just now when you started your show off at the beginning. We were talking about uh, uh, what what uh, Obama did covertly. Yes. And it, it, now that odd story to me just makes perfect sense. Hmm. No, well, I think that the uh, bombs that we put in, the, uh, you know, the, the bombs that would be triggered weren't really against their you know, operating systems on, well, it could have been, you know what, who knows, it could have been on their operating systems that that they switched out because they, you know, ran their electric grid or, uh, you know, the banking system, who the hell knows? I I don't remember the story, but yeah, that, that, you know, if it happened uh, that way and, and I mean, what do you want me to say? I didn't see the story. (laughs) No, no, that's no, that's all right. But I just want I just wanted to bring it to your attention. I, I I do remember the story. Now it's okay. You don't remember it, but I do well, remember. I, it. I don't watch any. I, you know, the, now. for news, I read newspapers just so everybody knows. Like if you see yeah. something, I haven't seen it. If. It wasn't on a CNN, okay, or the right. or the News Hour, okay, on PBS or on C-SPAN. These are the these are the places I get my information: C-SPAN, uh, PBS, and CNN. I don't really watch much of anything else, okay. So if you're watching this guy or that guy, and it's on that channel or this channel, you know this. And then you know I read newspapers every day. Yeah, so you so so it's very strong possibility you missed it. I just want to just uh, yes. share that with you. I said to myself, hmm, back in back in September, I think it was, it's more around there. I said to myself, hmm, that's a very odd story. Okay. You know, but since you brought it up, I didn't. It makes sense to me. Well, I I, I didn't bring it up because I didn't see it. <laughs> I'm sure I didn't bring it up. Uh, Noble in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hi, uh, Randy. Hey, Tulsa. Have fun. Hope you have fun in Costa Rica. How do you know I'm going? I hope you are. Huh? I hope you are. I am. <laughs> you might have to stay here. Um, I've been looking at. Do you guys want me train. to periscope from there? Because I'm warning you right now. It, it you know, uh, the the scenery is beautiful, but I will not put myself in any of these videos. <laughs> Don't just hey, I want to see it. I want to see it. Yeah, no. Hey, uh, it's very humid I've been there, going over and uh, dealing with the Panama Papers. Okay. Um, as of a couple of weeks ago, Mark Kiswick, the uh, attorney, private attorney for uh, Donald Trump, Kasowitz. Kasowitz. Kislyak is the Russian. Kasowitz is the attorney. Cor- I knew you were going to correct me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that uh, that was to free Barrara. Free Barrara's since then tweeted that the power of the people is greater than the president of the United States. Well, that's true. Free Barr was investigating the Panama Papers when he was fired. It was a wholesale firing of the U.S. Attorney General. Do you remember that? Yes. 59, something like that? Yes. Say say to Rod Rosenstein and the Brant lady. Okay, well, the Panama Papers... Um, don't have too much details with um, U.S. businesses or U.S. law firms because the clients that are involved in these Panama Papers in the United States are protected under the Constitution with their civil rights and uh, attorney-client privilege. Yeah. So what we need is that there may be a lawyer listening somewhere that has information for the uh, law firms dealing with Panama Papers in the, in the United States. Okay, so let, um, let's put it this way. If there is a law firm uh, in Washington, D.C., they're involved in the Panama Papers. Okay, it just is like that. 
Okay, well, this they, guy Bradley, there is not one law firm in Washington D.C. that doesn't have a client overseas or doesn't have an American okay. client that's got money funneled through. Uh, oh, just the pressure of a, of a place, Panama, the Caymans, uh, the Bank of Cyprus. I mean, this Virgin is Virgin Islands. Yes, I mean it's ridiculous to yeah. think that there is any Washington law. Listen, Obama. I was reading last night Jack Abramoff of the Abramoff scandal. Okay, he's back yeah. lobbying for Congo. <laughs> yeah, it may go back to Bernie Madoff. All no, Bernie no, money. Bernie was a different thing. Bernie was a you know a Ponzi scheme where you know he was telling his uh, investors that you know he was investing in in all these different things and and okay. really he was just keeping their money. But uh, so, this, this is laundering. This is my, that is why it matters whom whom Mueller hires. And when you look at the guys that Mueller is hiring, he's hiring guys who are brilliant at unraveling financial funnels, financial uh, you know money laundering schemes, tracing money, following money, understanding the path of money. That is a nightmare for Donald Trump. A nightmare. But that's that's what uh, Mueller is investigating. Mueller is investigating criminal money laundering and financial crimes. Uh, that's a problem for Trump. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes Air Force. Air, Air, Air Force. RandyRhodes.com. Now, the top of the hour on the Progressive Voices channel on TuneIn presents the Green News Report. The primary control knob is the um, uh, ocean waters and the, uh, this environment that we live in. The head of the U.S. Department of Energy goes full science denial. Trump administration seeks to reactivate Yucca Mountain nuclear waste site. Plastic pollution has now reached Antarctica. Renewable energy actually helps electric grid stability. Plus... British government to invest a billion dollars in shift to electric cars. All of those shifts, oh, I see what you did there, and more straight ahead. From Bradblog.com, I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyen. Stand by for six minutes of independent green news, politics, analysis, and snarky comment. There is a massive heat wave out west. Today, temperatures are expected to reach 127 degrees in Death Valley. But, but, it's a dry death. <laughs> so there's that. This is your Green News Report. Okay, Desi Doyen, Donald Trump has a great new idea that I am certain is going to make you be in favor of his border wall. <laughs> Not too fast. At a campaign rally in Cedar Rapids, Iowa on Wednesday, Donald Trump said he is toying with the idea of putting solar panels on his border wall at the U.S.-Mexico border. We're thinking about building the wall as a solar wall so it creates energy. And pays for itself. But I thought Mexico was going to pay for it. And this way, Mexico will have to pay much less money. Oh, I see. All right, well, that explains that. Is that good, Desi Doyen? <laughs> well, it would be doable, but it would be actually cheaper and way simpler to just put solar panels where the people are. Well, that's true. And if he really wants that much solar, nothing's stopping him from building the solar without the wall. He really is the king of the trolls. It looks like CNBC is a go-to safe space for climate science deniers in the Trump administration. In an interview with CNBC's Joe Kernan, also a climate science denier, the U.S. Secretary of Energy Rick Perry, the guy responsible for the nation's nuclear plants and nuclear warheads, denied the basic physics that carbon dioxide is the primary driver of warming in the atmosphere. You believe CO2 is the primary control knob for the temperature of the earth and for uh, for climate no most likely the primary control knob is the um, uh, ocean waters and the uh, this environment that we live in <laughs> yes it's the ocean waters and the environment we live in that is heating up the environment yeah. that we live in it was barely coherent and just want to point out the the oceans are harmed by carbon dioxide emissions because warming waters seriously damage coral reefs and the ocean itself is becoming more acidic as it absorbs some of our co2 emissions 
Perry also generated bipartisan anger from Nevada's congressional delegation when he said in a congressional hearing this week that the Trump administration intends to reverse the Obama administration's decision to shutter the controversial Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Repository located just 80 miles from Las Vegas. Nevada has no nuclear plants, and a majority of Nevadans object to being forced to bear the burden and the risk of other states' toxic radioactive nuclear waste in perpetuity. Renewable energy does not harm the reliability of the electric grid and, in fact, helps it. That's according to a new analysis published in advance of a soon-to-be-released Department of Energy study into whether wind and solar negatively impact grid reliability. That was ordered by Secretary Perry. Perry hinted that he might try to roll back state renewable energy targets using grid reliability as an issue of national security. But a new report from energy consulting firm The Analysis Group this week concludes that adding new renewable energy capacity to the U.S. electric grid actually increases the grid's reliability. Or, as Rick Perry might say... Oops. California Energy Commissioner David Hotschild said California's grid is managing the rise of renewables just fine. And he notes that the countries with the most wind and solar, Denmark and Germany, have 10 times fewer power outages than the U.S. Plastic pollution has made it to the Antarctic. Researchers from the British Antarctic Survey, who recently had to move their research station due to unstable melting ice, announced this week that they found surprisingly high levels of tiny plastic pollution, five times Times higher than they expected in the Antarctic Ocean brought in by ocean currents. We really ruin everything, don't we? But some good news. World coal production dropped by the largest amount ever in history last year and saw the largest rise in renewable energy generation. That's according to the annual BP World Energy Report. And China, for the first time, surpassed the U.S. to become the world's largest renewable energy producer. And Britain announced this week that it will invest nearly a billion dollars in zero emissions technology with the goal of requiring nearly all vehicles in Britain to be zero emission by 2050 and mandating the building Building out of an electric car charging infrastructure at gas stations and rest areas. England's doing it. India's doing it. China's doing it. Maybe someday the U.S. will do it. Maybe. Leading the world from behind. For much more on all of those stories, please check out our website at greennews.bradblog.com. Find us, follow us, and share us worldwide on the Facebooks and the Twitters at Green News Report. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyan. And this has been your Green News Report. Everybody's doing a red dance now. This has been the Green News Report on the top of the hour on the Progressive Voices Channel on TuneIn. Mary, how does the book man, man, man? The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. A radio beacon, two radio beacons. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Roach. Turn up your mind. I've seen the tweet about tapes. Lordy, I hope there are tapes. <laughs> I, I remember saying, I agree he's a good guy, as a way of saying I'm not agreeing with what you just asked me to do. Again, maybe other people would be stronger in that circumstance, but that, that was, uh, that's how I conducted myself. I, I hope I'll never have another opportunity. Maybe if I did it again, I would do it better. There should be no fuzz on this whatsoever. The Russians interfered in our election during the 2016 cycle. They did it with purpose. They did it with sophistication. They did it with overwhelming technical efforts. And it was an active measures campaign driven from the top of that government. There is no fuzz on that. It is a high confidence judgment of the entire intelligence community. And and the members of this committee have uh, seen the intelligence. It's not a close call. That happened. That's about as unfake as you can possibly get and is very, very serious, which is why it's so refreshing to see a bipartisan focus on that, because this is about America, not about any particular party. So that was a hostile act by the Russian government against this country? Yes, sir. Did the president in any of those interactions that you've um, shared with us today ask you what you should be doing or what our government should be doing or the intelligence community to protect America against Russian interference in our election system? I don't recall a conversation like that. Oh, God. Never. No. 
Do you, do you find not with, it not odd? With, not with President Trump. Right. I attended a fair number of meetings on that with uh, President Obama. So now you know what Comey was talking about, uh, the pre- President Obama. Oh, by the way, to my uh, my guy in Mississippi, you're right. We looked it up over the break because uh, I don't watch, uh, you know, other channels. But uh, we did find, uh, you know, at least two articles about the Russians changing their uh, operating systems from Microsoft to uh, a Russian uh, state-run carrier called Rostel, Rostelecom, Rostel, Rostelecom. Uh, that's a Bloomberg News report, and it's also in Quartz. It's it, it's it's pretty much easily found. Um, they um, they installed software developed by Russia's new cloud technologies to replace Microsoft Windows and Office on nearly six hundred thousand devices. Six hundred thousand devices, and of course. Um, that happened uh, in September. On the 27th is when we uh, actually could find the first articles about it. So that would go right along with the timeline that is in the Washington Post today where the president uh, previously, uh, the President Obama, had found out that Russia was, uh, you know, hacking all, all over the place, um, and that he briefed his Department of Homeland Security, obviously the FBI director, obviously the National Security Agency, the CIA, the, uh, the NSA, and the Gang of Eight in the Senate and the House. And uh, then, um, you know, Russia, they, they decided to plant these little bombs uh, to affect critical infrastructure in Russia if they didn't stop meddling. Obama called Putin three times to tell him to stop meddling. And uh, they think that by September 27th, Putin gave up uh, trying to uh, do more to meddle in our elections. However, they did in Russia change over 600,000 devices from the Microsoft operating system and uh, moved it over to Outlook as well. You know, Microsoft Exchange, Outlook, uh, you know, the uh, 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 all the, the operating systems that came from Silicon Valley, and they started to use their own, their own technologies. Uh, on six hundred thousand, so that that that's a good that's that goes right into the timeline. It fits just beautifully. It makes uh, perfect sense, which is something that you'll never get from the Donald. You'll just never get it. He doesn't care about our safety, our security. He only cares about the way he comes off. He only cares about the moment that he's in, that everybody's adoring, that everybody loves. It. And I got to tell you, it's very bizarre. You know, I'm looking at like the jobs, he, you know, the jobs versus uh, what he claimed he would do. You know, Carrier is losing uh, 800, uh, what, 600 jobs. Uh, Boeing, um, you know, it, it matters, by the way, whether or not you worked in Boeing, uh, uh, Washington State, because Washington State had unions. <clears throat> and uh, whether or not you work at Boeing outside of Washington State where there are no unions, because they are firing people left and right, but the people who were represented by unions in Washington State, they got offered buyouts rather than just, you know, pink slips. Bye-bye. Don't let the door hit you with a good Lord split you. You know, like that. Uh, but, you know, you listen to these stupid speeches that Trump made at Carrier, etc. right? And you just realize he cares about the moment. And nothing but we can't allow this to happen anymore with our country. So many jobs are leaving and going to other countries, not mm. just Mexico, many, many countries. And China is making so much of our product that we're closing up a lot of plants. And I mean, I wrote down some numbers that are incredible, but the numbers of manufacturing jobs that are lost, especially in the Rust Belt <laughs> and the Rust Belt is so incredible, but we're losing companies. It's it's. <clears throat> Unbelievable, one after another. Companies are not going to leave the United States anymore without consequences. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Say it again. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> we're losing our, and we're losing so much. <clears throat> so, one of the things we're doing to keep them is we're going to be lowering our business tax <laughs> from 35% hopefully down to 15%, which would take us from the highest tax nation virtually in the world. This is terrible for business. <laughs> to one of the lower tax, not the lowest yet, but one of the lower tax. I just want to let all of the other companies know that we're going to do great things for business. There's no reason for them to leave anymore because your taxes are going to be at the very, very low end and your unnecessary regulations are going to be gone. We need regulations for safety and environment and things. <laughs> 
most of the regulations are nonsense. So many people in the other, that big, big, beautiful plant behind us, which will be even more beautiful in about seven months from now. Uh. They're so happy. They're going to have a great Christmas. Okay, let's look at their Christmas upcoming. Carrier said publicly that 800 safe jobs are going to be eliminated by automation and uh, that 600 carrier jobs are moving to Mexico. Uh, the layoffs are now actually coming in the month of July and then the rest right before Christmas. What? It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Oh, man. Yeah. So um, and then, you know, he says things like uh, uh, we, we've ended the war on clean, beautiful coal. We're putting our nation's coal miners back to work. Um, and he claimed do we have I don't know if I have that clip. Do we have the clip where he says that uh, he created um, 33,000 mining jobs? No. Yeah, I think it might be on my my list of stuff, except I don't know how to get back. Well, maybe I. Hey, wait, 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 wait. This is Boeing, and we could play that one, too. Oh, yeah, here it is. I have it. I have it. Hang on. Listen to this. Get ready to go to work. Oh, we're going to put our miners back to work. We're going to put the miners back to work. Okay, here's his record. We've ended the war on clean, beautiful coal. Yeah. And we're putting our miners back to work. And 33,000 mining jobs have been added since my inauguration. 33,000 mining jobs have been added since my inauguration. Let's fact check that, shall we? Coal mining added 1,000 new jobs. A coal mine did open in Pennsylvania. It added 70 jobs. <laughs> Insane, right? Insane. It's going to save all the carrier jobs. Uh, 600 people are getting laid off. Some will be next month, and the rest will be laid off uh, over Christmas. Uh, let's check his Boeing thing. Hang on. That plane, as beautiful as it looks, is 30 years old. Can you believe it? What can look so beautiful at 30? An airplane. What's wrong with him? What, what's I don't it, know. 15? Which one do we like better, folks? Tell me. When American workers win, America as a country wins. Big league wins. <laughs> That's my message here today. America is going to start winning again, winning like never, ever before. There's so much winning. We're not going to let our country be taken advantage of anymore in any way, shape, or form. Now oh, you're going to love that. We love America, and we are going to protect America. Okay, I think you get the gist, right? That was him at the Boeing factory. Um, I believe that was February. Uh, looks like um, in March, Boeing said it will cut jobs at its commercial jet factories in Washington State um, and that they will be cutting 500 positions, um, except that the ones in Washington State, those, those workers were represented by unions, the unions reported that at least 1,800 Boeing employees were able to take voluntary buyouts, except that the non-union workers, um, they'll just be getting um, pink slips, you know, and be told bye-bye. Uh, let's see. Ford, I didn't even pull it, but you know, Ford is not going to move to Mexico. Ford is not going to move to Mexico. Ford is not going to move to Mexico. He's right. Ford is moving to China. Ford had originally planned to open up a $1.6 billion plant in Mexico, but Donald Trump saying, you know, they were going to build a wall and all this. So they said, eh, we don't really want to go to Mexico. So they canceled those plans and they chose China instead. That's good. I mean, this guy, nothing he, you know, nothing he's, and he keeps on saying how many pieces of legislation he signed. And, you know, I got to tell you, you know, putting people on the board of the Smithsonian is uh, not the kind of thing that he was elected to do. Naming a site to build a Gulf War memorial was not the kind of thing people had in mind uh, if they were one of the forgotten. It just wasn't. And having their Medicaid cut by $880 uh, mil, uh, million dollars was, was, was not what they were hoping for when they, uh, you know, decided, uh, oh, let's just give this nutbag a chance.
I don't I don't think there was anything that you had in mind. This health care thing is so bad. Obama actually uh, gave a, 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 a little um, paragraph or two about it on his Facebook page. He said, the Senate bill is not a health care bill. It is a massive transfer of wealth from middle class and poor families to the richest people in America. It hands enormous tax cuts to the rich and to the drug and insurance industries paid for by cutting health care for everybody else. Those with private insurance will experience higher premiums, higher deductibles, hello, with lower tax credits to help working families cover the costs, even as their plans might no longer cover pregnancy, mental health care, or expensive prescriptions. Discrimination based on pre-existing conditions could become the norm again. Millions of families will lose coverage entirely. And then he points out that the fight for the uh, Affordable Health Care Act, you know, his uh, Obamacare, took more than a year with thousands upon thousands of Americans uh, because we knew it would save lives, pre- prevent financial misery, and ultimately set this country we love on a better, healthier course. And he ended it with a, a call to action for you to call Congress and visit their offices and speak out and let them know, the country know, in very real terms, what this means for you and your family. After all, this is bigger than politics. It's about the character of our country, who we are and who we aspire to be. The Randy Rhodes Air Force. The Randy Rhodes Show is live on randyrhodes.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. Oh, you know, Herky Jerky, guess what they got? Guess what they did for you? Oh, my God. You asked, you got four new flavors, original, spicy, teriyaki, and barbecue. Now, nitrate and preservative free in giant resealable 14-ounce bags. You asked for this, and they created... Four new flavors without nitrates, without preservatives, in big, beautiful, resealable 14-ounce bags. Tender, small strips. Existing mild and hot beef jerky is still available for the customers who prefer that style. You know, I love that style. But you asked for nitrate preservative-free, you asked for resealable bags, and you asked for new flavors. And so now you have barbecue, teriyaki, spicy, and original. $5 off in the month of June on every pack of the new beef jerky with a promo code of BEEF. Yes, BEEF. Go to herkyjerky.com, enter BEEF. Tales of American Political History with Clinton Porter Hackney. The pauper Clarence Gideon had appealed his fifth prison sentence on the grounds that the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution gave him the right to a lawyer. But that was only in federal cases. So Gideon's appeal argued that the Fourteenth Amendment's Due Process Clause required the Sixth Amendment to be applied to the states, and the Supreme Court agreed. It would be difficult to overstate the impact of Gideon's case on life in America. Police officers advise criminal suspects of their right to an attorney every day, and principles adopted in Gideon became half of the famous Miranda warnings. Judges also deal with Gideon in courtrooms everywhere, trying to determine if defendants can afford a lawyer. We don't know if Clarence Gideon robbed the pool hall in Florida or not, but he was acquitted in his second trial. Regardless, it was Gideon's initiative and probably a cellmate's education that dramatically changed the course of our legal system. This is Clinton Porter Hackney at cphackney.com. Okay, enough is enough, people. Some of you on Facebook have lost your damn minds. Welcome to She Persisted. I'm Melissa Carter for the Progressive Voices Network. While scrolling on my Facebook feed recently, I saw a picture of an open casket. That's right. Someone decided the perfect time to break out the phone and take a picture is during a funeral when they approached an open casket. Now, there are some things I don't want to see on Facebook, and that is one of them. But you violate so many other common sense rules on Facebook that no wonder young kids have no interest in opening a Facebook account. Really, studies show that kids don't think Facebook is cool. And one reason? You post pics from the hospital. First of all, 
A hospital gown is rarely flattering, and neither is the fluorescent lighting above a gurney, so why in the hell are you taking a selfie at that time? Even worse, when you take a picture of another person admitted into the hospital. They don't want that posted. And even if I was dozing off from anesthesia, I would knock that phone out of your hand if I saw you taking a picture of me, half out of it, with an IV hanging out of my arm. On a lesser level, but just as frustrating, is your need to take pictures of people who are sick at home. Maybe it's to prove that they really are sick if they called into work, but don't post pictures of anybody sick. And you parents who post pics of kids, either in the hospital or at home, who don't feel well, shame on you. They don't want that. And what is the purpose? It seems that Facebook has simply become an online prayer line, and your need to make your kid look as pitiful as possible to get attention is offensive. Facebook is still a great way to stay in touch with those you no longer see, but how about we stop being ridiculous? If you wouldn't place a picture in a frame in your office then why the hell are you posting it online? This has been She Persisted with the Progressive Voices Network. I'm Melissa Carter. We did it, you bastards. We're live. And it only took two years. Okay. All right. So we're back. We're live. And you're there. And we're here. And ain't that great. Now, let me just tell you that if you want to listen whenever and wherever you'd like to listen, just go to randyroads.com, click on podcasts and swag, and get your podcast commercial free on demand on any device. RandyRhodes.com. Open all day, every day. Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561 270 3844. 561 270 3844. But this one is quite final. I mean, the president tweeted this. And, and he made he made everyone, I mean, frankly, I don't think people really thought there were, t- there were tapes, but maybe there was. I mean, with, with no good motive, there's absolutely no good motive for saying this, for tweeting this, except to try to intimidate James Comey. And then he had many opportunities to fix it, and he doesn't. And now today, when all the attention is on health care, it's almost like he slips it in to sort of get out of, get out of trouble. But, you know, this is not just bad tweeting. This well, runs the I, risk I, I, of intimidation of a witness. Oops. Whoops, when you lose Greta Van Susteren, uh, you've pretty much lost uh, the Republican Party. I, really? I mean, she's saying it's witness intimidation, uh, you know, what he did. He's saying, you know, it was strategic to keep Comey honest, and Comey testified that Trump asked him for loyalty, uh, that he took notes, that Trump had him over for dinner, and in one dinner he threatened his job. He told him he wanted to let Flynn go, let Flynn go, let Flynn go. Uh, so, I mean, was, you know, th- 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 it's so stupid what he does that uh, only he could do it. <laughs> it's just like, a, it's an amazing thing. But there was Greta Van Susteren saying, this is witness intimidation. And you know what witness intimidation is? It's obstruction of justice. So that's why the president has now moved the collusion out of the conversation and he keeps focusing on, there's no obstruction, there's no obstruction. There is obstruction. First of all, you threatened James Comey, who testified under oath. You haven't testified under oath, although you said you would. You, t- you told everybody in the, in the entire United States, oh, in a heartbeat, 100%, I will testify under oath. Well, let's have it, because, you know, Hillary Clinton was under oath for, what, 11 freaking hours? 11 hours? And a- after 11 hours, they took one clip of the whole thing. What difference does it make? Remember? After 11 hours. 58 in hearings, 58 hearings on Benghazi, Benghazi. It's very sad. Brother David. Very sad, sister, indeed. Sad I watched, and bad. Sad and bad, yes. Hardly rad. I watched all 11 hours of those hearings. And as I recall, it was the moment that you and I both had to admit, well, she does look presidential. Yeah. Um, but it was transparency. And for a year and a half, the Affordable Care Act was argued in open debate in Congress on C-SPAN, and there was transparency. There's no transparency here. Oh, it's- come on! They wrote this is the this is the 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 definition of a smoke-filled backroom deal. Exactly. 
I mean, truly it is. And, and you know, Mitch McConnell, you'll, you'll have plenty of time. Plenty of time, I tell you. Plenty of time. I mean, he re- he releases the stupid thing yesterday. Uh, we, mm-hmm. all, we, we all go nuts trying to read these 142 pages. We find out that, you know, uh, uh, the kids, kids who with disabilities are going to be absolutely mangled uh, by this bill. Thank you. You know, I mean, a health care bill that, that, that literally makes you sick oh, is not a health care bill. Oh. And, and, and there's no debate. There's no hearings. There's no witnesses. There's no CBO score yet. What are they supposed to be debating? They're not debating. They're, They're not. It's, 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 it, it can't happen here, has happened here. But you know what's really and, crazy is everything Trump does hurts Trump voters the most. Oh, absolutely. This and, is why and I'm I, sad and I swear more than angry to God, or anything else. I swear to God, they, are, they just will never figure that out. I talk to them all the time. I go into their chat rooms and I, I do everything I can to I reach out to them to are. try and protect them because they will be losing their health care in droves. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to blame he, it on Obamacare. He'll totally blame it on Obamacare. And as someone who works for Obamacare, I can tell you, the, the company, and I can't say the name, you know, I have to watch watch my job, but is very much aware of what you just said and is trying to do its best to float and keep this going. And at the same time, what's going to happen when that bottom drops out and prepare for the unpreparable for? Um, I have a quick sidebar from the chat room. They wanted me to tell you and the Howard and I'm adding in Scott XXOO. We love you. Thank you. And there I've done my duty. OK, thank you. Um, but seriously, it's 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 going to ha- it, we we all are going to have to do it state by state and and come from the inside out because they're just going to well, do whatever. Well, here's the good news, do. everybody. Here is the good news for the chat room, for the people on all the different platforms. Uh, we have five senators now. They you know they could lose two, and Pence could break the tie, right? Uh, okay. As of yesterday, they were down four senators, Republicans, because all Democrats are not going to vote to take these kids, uh, you know, with special health care needs and throw them to Thank the wind. You. That's never going to happen. Democrats don't no. vote that way. But so we lost four yesterday, and then today, Dean Heller from Nevada, who we're all watching because he has to run for re-election, he's a right. no. Uh, of course, Murkowski, Susan Collins, uh, Capu- Capito, the women, they haven't weighed in. But there's no way that they're going to allow, you know, uh, their vote to go for something that hurts children in this they manner. They won't come back if they do. <laughs> they simply won't be back if they do. Now, 25%, I, uh, if not 50, of the voted country's voting bloc is going to go, uh-uh. Yeah, I eventually. mean, so, eventually. so this thing isn't going to pass. I mean, there's just no, no way that this sees the light of day. It's but just... It's, it's, as you said, though, it's the uncertainty. It's the fact that it's so in and out. That's so what's I killing com- our ability to get the prices down is all this uncertainty. Uh, are they going to do the risk corridors? Are they going to pay the billions that they owe? Are they going to give people, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the benefit that helps them meet their deductible? I mean, that's what's causing all this uncertainty. They're, they're literally killing Obamacare on purpose. On purpose, they're letting it die a slow, strangulated death. And I'm telling you, my coworkers here in the blue crown of an otherwise red with a few purple splatches state are starting. They're not. We're not even in the, cha- in the break rooms and in the smoke shack and in the parking lot. Everybody's aware of it, and they're like, well, "This, this is this is insane. This can't. This just can't happen." Yeah. But no. And there he sits. I love you always. Have a fabulous weekend, my darling. Thank you. Gorgeous hazmat suits for everybody. <laughs> uh, Galen in Alexandria, Virginia. Now, happy Friday, Randy. Happy Friday, you bastard. <laughs> you bastard. You bastard. Okay, I just want to point out again, as I did a couple of weeks ago, that we got the, there was no collusion, no <laughs> obstruction, call me Lloyd. Again, the second time. The second time. All right, now... The Washington Post article about Obama. Wow. I mean, I haven't even made it all the way through. But I have a question, which is that I can understand that Obama may not have wanted to wade into this and make the issue worse. I I can see that. But once you have the knowledge that Russia is attempting to throw the election to Trump, why do you not appoint a special counsel hmm good question well there are people I mean, in this article the re- in this article and you'll make your way through it there is a quote from one of the uh people that they spoke to about this and they said, said they choked yeah yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, when you have in your hand the intelligence report from 17 intel agencies that say this is what happened. Right. If he, if Obama would have appointed a special counsel at the point, and I love Obama. No, I, know. I think Obama is the best president in my lifetime. I'm 55. I don't think there'll be a better president. But I think this was a mistake. We'd be further along. Look how long we had to wait to get a special prosecutor, only until they got rid of poor Comey, your well, boyfriend. Well, I think the reason is is something along these lines. Who was the special prosecutor to investigate? The You know, the Russians? Right. Inve- investigate the Russian hacking. Well, that, that already happened. That's what the intelligence agencies had done, and they produced a report that definitively said that uh, Putin, they captured Putin's orders. They had, uh, you know, uh, seen the hacking. They understood where uh, uh, where they were active. They they understood that there were trolls. They understood the fake. They understood the whole scenario. So you didn't really need to, you can't prosecute a foreign government. Yeah, you're right. So you only get a prosecutor when you get to the, especially the obstruction. Well, when he fires Comey. Yeah, right. That's right. That's exactly right. right. So you know what were they going to do with a, mm-hmm. a prosecutor? You can't prosecute Russia in America. You can't do it. I mean, you could sue them. You could, and you know, uh, whatever. But it's a foreign country. You know, they're not subject to our laws, except our laws of war. And this was an act of war. And so what you have is what do you want to do about it? And that's why Obama sprinkled, as Kellyanne Conway calls it, this intelligence throughout our government. He, I mean, he started to spread uh, this intelligence information once the election was over uh, to various people. Yeah, I'm glad. He, I know. I, I, you know, I just, uh, I wish we would have known. I just wish we would have known. I feel like. Oh, uh, listen, if you worked on the Hillary campaign, you're probably kicking yourself and you're probably so pissed off today to see that there was, you know, um, there was a completed investigation. There was already a, a response to it in place. Uh, there was a counter response on Russia's part, as our caller from Mississippi pointed out, that Russia switched from American operating systems to Russian operating systems to try to avoid our, uh, you know, punishment that we, you know, uh, meted out to them through their operating systems we put these bombs in there i mean you know all this was underway all this was going on all this was you know uh uh, and if you supported hillary clinton you're probably like really really not happy today to find out that all of this had gone that far and and the american people weren't allowed to know which i did i supported hillary i did a little work for her so there you go i mean that's probably why you know people are just so uh freaking upset right now but you know, I think that because it, the the election was so fraught, and because uh, Donald Trump was relying publicly on Russia and hacking and WikiLeaks, and he loved WikiLeaks, and he was, you know, tweeting this stuff and he was quoting this, I think Obama thought in the end, if Trump should prevail, the the Justice Department will have a target to take down as the beneficiary of, uh, you know, the Russian hacking. And uh, that obviously Donald Trump's own words clearly showed that he knew who was doing it and that it would be, you know, the end of him. And that was the well, only safe thing he could do without throwing, uh, you know, the United States into some sort of a civil war. Yeah. In the meantime, let's all fight every policy like this horrible. He North has Carolina. no policies, I'm telling you. What he's got is, you know, symptoms. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for your kind words, Randy. You're and welcome. Happy Friday. Thank you, Galen. Bye. Bye. Uh, Bridget in London, Ontario. Hi, Randy. First time, long time. Hi. I've been waiting 15 years for that. Oh my God. I just wanted to give you a little uh, my insight on our Canadian healthcare system we got over here. Yeah. Uh, uh, like I know, the American system is all based on money and the insurance companies and profit. Right. And I don't ever see the Canadian system ever taking off over there. But just it makes me shaken mad to see what you guys have going on over there. Oh, People it's... losing their homes and just the poverty it creates. It just it makes me so sad. 
Yeah, it is and, sad. It's very sad. You know, here, here's a proposal, okay? I mean, if if America doesn't want to go to a Canadian single-payer system, Howard has had this idea. I mean, you know, uh, this, Howard has had this idea for a very long time, and it makes nothing but sense. Why don't we treat health care in America the same way we treat other... Um, n- Car insurance. No, no, um, no, the, no. The other, other, um, you know, essentials like electricity, like water. Those are declared utilities. And, and they're regulated. Not only the profit margin is regulated. That's the important right. part of a utility. Yes, you know, here in Florida, we have FP&L. Yes, they make a profit. Of course, they make a profit, and the government subsidizes them for research and development and other things. However, and you do pay a bill, and it's not cheap, but the profit margin is regulated because it's an essential for you to live. Like, right. uh, you know, and so that's what the regulations around utilities look like. There's a regulated, uh, you know, amount of profit that you can make. Uh, why don't we just treat healthcare that way? I'll tell you, you know, my mom. She's 74 years old. I got her hooked on your show, by the way. Oh, hi, Mom. She had two knee replacements and two hip replacements within five years. Mm. She's not bankrupt. She still owns her home. Right, right. I understand. It's it's kind of ridiculous when you look at, you know, when you just say the statement, and it's a true statement, that the United States of America is the only industrialized nation in the world that doesn't offer national health care. We are the only nation, and we spend more per person currently than any other nation, and we get less, less coverage than any other nation. How is that smart? Or go- You know, he's supposed to be this uh, magnificent bastard of a businessman, right? He's like, oh, you magnificent bastard. Meanwhile, he doesn't understand that we spend more per person and get less per person, and that he should chuck this whole for-profit system. Okay, fine. Not ready to go there? Fine. Treat healthcare like a utility. It's essential to live. If you have a melanoma, if you have diabetes, if you got, if you had a stroke, if you, you know, it's essential. So treat it like a utility, and keep the profits lower. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes Air Force. Air, Air, Air Force. RandyRhodes.com. <laughs> Hey, do you own gold? You know, if you don't, you're in a bad position. Stocks are at an all-time high. Gold at recent lows. So maybe to you it seems like things are going great, but I can assure you if another stock market crash comes, if another 2008 happens, are you protected? I don't think so. Don't wait until after something bad happens because then stocks fall and gold goes up. Get gold now while it's low and diversify your portfolio today. Because once you have gold in your portfolio, you can rest assured you are protected. So call my friends at ITM Trading at one triple eight own gold They're experts at diversifying investment portfolios with precious metals. They can help you in building a custom strategy based on your goals, your objectives. Please don't follow the herd and don't wait till it's too late. Take action today and bring safety to your financial future. Call ITM Trading today at one triple eight own gold and speak to a precious metals expert and ask for a free gold kit. one triple eight own gold one triple eight O W N G O L D. Hi, True Seekers, it's Kathy Malloy. If you haven't heard the Mike Malloy show lately, this is what you've been missing. It was just after midnight when the call came in. 15-year-old male, single GSW. To the abdomen, stable vitals. When the paramedics squealed him in, his heart rate, blood pressure, and oxygen levels were normal. A nurse said to him, it's going to be okay, you're going to be fine. But things were not okay. Two minutes later, he was gasping for breath. His oxygen level was dropping, as was his blood pressure. When we turned him over, we found an exit wound the size of a small grapefruit. Early in my medical training, I learned that it is not the bullet that kills you, but the path the bullet takes. A non-expanding bullet or full metal jacket bullet often enters the body in a straight line. Like a knife, it damages the organs and tissues directly in its path, and then it either exits the body or, if it is traveling at a slower velocity, is stopped by bone, tissue, or skin. This is in contrast to expanding bullets. 
especially if shot from an assault rifle, which can discharge bullets much faster than a handgun. Once they enter the body, they fragment and explode, pulverizing bones, tearing blood vessels, and liquefying organs. This is what was happening to my patient, whose heart quickly stopped beating. We performed an emergency thoractotomy, splitting open his chest in an attempt to clamp off bleeding and restart his heart. Blood poured out of his chest cavity. The bullet had disintegrated his spleen and torn his aorta. Four ribs had essentially turned to dust. The damage was far too extensive. He died in our ER. He was 15. This is the intended consequence of assault rifles. How do we get to this? How do we get to the point where guns and the proliferation of guns, everybody have a gun, became a driving force of the U.S. Congress. Who did that? I mean, no, Martians didn't land here and, and, and write this legislation and get it passed, and then the people who wrote it and passed it got reelected. Those weren't Martians. Those were us. And why did we do it? Because we are the stupidest sons of bitches where it concerns electoral politics ever. And we're willing to sacrifice children. You know, human sacrifice has been a part of human history since people lived in trees, right? Got to satisfy uh, the God of anger or the God of this or the God of that. So kill some, kill a virgin, kill a kid. That's just part of it. That, that's what you do. You kill them. That's what we do. Let's go kill some kids. And sometimes in a real frenzy of bowing down to the gun God, we will allow a whole classroom of our children, our six-year-olds, to be executed on the spot, blown to pieces. And the next day, the next week, the next month, yawn. Well, the gun god's been satisfied for a while. Until the next one. Those people have to die 30000 a year so the gun industry can live. 25 kids a week. Hell, there's 330 million people in this country. 25 kids a week. Tough, sad, but the gun industry has to live on. Your child can die, but the gun industry must live on. Listen live to The Mike Malloy Show weeknights at 6 p.m. in the West, 9 p.m. in the East, only on the Progressive Voices Network. Can't listen live? Download the podcast at MikeMalloy.com. Don't miss a minute of the fun and frivolity. This is the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. Well, I didn't tape him. Uh, you never know what's happening when you see that the Obama administration, and perhaps longer than that, was doing all of this unmasking and uh, surveillance, and you read all about it, and I've been reading about it for the last couple of months about the seriousness of the and horrible situation with surveillance all over the place and <laughs> you've been hearing the word unmasking a, a word you probably never heard before so you never know what's out there but i didn't tape and i don't have any tape and i didn't tape oh my god he is I, 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 he is so delusional i've seen the tweet about tapes lordy i hope there are tapes i i remember saying I agree he's a good guy as a way of saying I'm not agreeing with what you just asked me to do. Again, maybe other people would be stronger in that circumstance, but that, that was, uh, that's how I conducted myself. I, I hope I'll never have another opportunity. Maybe if I did it again, I would do it better. Lordy. So now we know why the intelligence community was so active. They weren't after, uh, you know, uh, per se, Donald Trump. They weren't surveilling Donald Trump. They weren't uh, wiretapping with two Ps, Donald Trump. They weren't doing anything. They were fighting back with with Putin. They were fighting Putin's uh, invasion into our uh, uh, election, uh, voter registration rolls, into our the DNC, the uh, RN. I mean, that 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 is it, that is so amazing. And Donald Trump must have known it. And this is what will come out in the wash because he's running around saying the whole thing's rigged. So and that Russia, if you're listening, Russia, if you're listening, keep hacking, keep hacking. How, why would he pick Russia to ask them to hack if he did? I mean, the man is just so stupid. 
Oh, and by the way, this was my favorite tweet of his. You know, they're making a lot about uh, the tapes and, you know, the lawyer one that was put out with the correct commas and the right amount of caps and all. But anyway, uh, he, he did this when Karen Handel won this week. He tweeted, Karen Handel becomes first woman representative Georgia has sent to Congress. Still waiting for the glass ceiling stories. Or do conservatives not get them? He's only about 95 years off. So, you know, why uh, point out how ridiculously stupid he is? Anybody remember Cynthia McKinney in the 90s? Yeah, she was from Georgia, representative. Anybody remember Denise Majette in like 2003? Yeah, she was a representative from Georgia. But the very first female representative from Georgia was Florence Reveal Gibbs. She was voted into office in 1940. After the death of her husband, there was a special election. She was followed by Helen Douglas Mankin in 1946 and Iris Faircloth Blitch in 1955. And then Cynthia McKinney in 93 and Denise Majette in 2003. Now, I will go back to the 95-year reference. Rebecca Lattimore Felton, she was sent to Congress in 1922 from the state of Georgia. She was an activist, a writer, a suffragette. And she was the first female senator ever from Georgia. But um, she only served one day, so I won't even count her. Uh, And I'll just say that, uh, you know, he's off by, uh, you know, uh, 60 years. What kind of an idiot do we have as president of the United States? Still waiting for the glass ceiling, uh, you know, uh, tribute. She's only like the sixth woman from Georgia. Idiot. Chris in Brooklyn. Ah, screw the grifter. Oh, my God. He is a grifter. That's a great it's, word. It's Friday, you bastard. You Let's bastard. Have some fun. Yeah, all it's right. Comey, Comey, Comey thing, you know? Uh huh. Why do you do that to the Howard? The Howard's a nice man. You're yeah, turning he's a, him into Jan Brady. The Howard is a beautiful man, a wonderful I man. Know. He's an important man, a man that, uh, you know, the second you meet him, you know that, you, you know, he's a man of substance, a man to be reckoned with. And I'm figuring five days a week he's got to watch you sit there quelling over this Comey, Comey, Comey. Actually, like, it's six Marcia, days Marcia. a week because I do Comey, Comey, Comey Monday through Friday. And then on Sunday, it's Anthony Bourdain. Ooh. But I have to throw over Anthony Bourdain. And I, I just to punish him, I'm going to start talking about, uh, you know, Tom Colicchio. Because, frankly, Anthony's in love with some Italian actress. And this is not going to work for me. Okay. While I was on hold, I studied up. I told Howard I was going to talk about Bezoars, right? Now, what do Elvis and John Wayne have in common? They died on the pot? Well, yeah, and when they were autopsy, they had these enormous growths inside their gastrointestinal tract, uh-huh. right? Yeah. I thought it was like calcified meat, but it's calcified anything else, really not meat. But anyway, Ugh. I'm looking forward to what's going to happen to the Orange Julius when the time comes, okay? Steve Bannon's got himself entrenched. He's set. He's set for life. He's loving it. He's having a grand old time. Mm. And one of these days, that guy with his KFC licking fingers and everything else that's going on in that, that world of his, he's just going to drop dead on the pot while, like, anger tweeting somebody, right? <laughs> now, let's go back to, like, Woodrow Wilson. He had his stroke. His wife took over. She was calling the shots. In the modern age, what do we have now? We've got the man and a Twitter account. Anyone can step up. Even Melania could step up. up. And we'd never even know the difference. Mm. Now, think about that. Yeah, well, you know, listen, we put up with a lot in this country. Ronald Reagan was probably not president for a lot longer than people might guess. I think that uh, Herbert Walker Bush was probably president for a lot longer than one term, you know? Uh, People are kept in the... You know, listen, just to be fair, JFK was a very sick man. He was. He, he, he had Addison's disease. He was in chronic. And uh, the American people were never told. So, yes, we know that Trump lives on uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. And we know that he lives on, uh, you know, well-done steaks with ketchup poured all over them. And we know that on Cinco de Mayo, he'll get a taco bowl from the Trump Grill, thinking it's Mexican somehow. Uh, but, you know, whatever. This is the way he chooses to live. You remember when his doctor, you know, uh, wrote this note that sounded so oh, Trumpian? Remember, it sounded like 
every tweet Trump ever sent. He's the most magnificent bastard. He's, he's in fabulous shape. He's in the best shape of any man I've ever examined in my entire life. You know, and, grammar runs in the family. But it, like, here's the thing: his Bund rally the other night. I mean, it's just such a trip. Always, it's always about the coal miners. It's always about no, the please. Pickup. There are only always, in this country. There are. F- there are more people that work as baristas than there are coal miners because it's done. It's been their jobs have been replaced in the 70s and the 80s by automation. This idea that the coal miners stand ready to go back to work is I mean, I've lived in Appalachia and I lived in Appalachia in the 80s and nobody was working. It was there were they were Rust Belt towns then. Well, our man from last week tonight pointed out that coals K-O-H-L-S is losing a lot more jobs than the coal there industry. There you go. That's they a good got one. got a lot more jobs than the coal industry going on. But I watch these things, and it's just like, I can't believe what's going on. And just like, he's got a set, so he just goes out there and presents himself. He gets the praise. He gets the applause. He feels better about himself. Nobody's talking about the permanent campaign. Nobody's talking about 2020. And it's just... It's you know, he's doing, he's doing a re-election fundraiser at his hotel in Washington D.C. Of course. I, I mean, he's gonna. He's he's already. You know, the, the he's 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 he opened. What was it? The uh, uh, reelect the president, the committee to reelect the president, creep or whatever it was. Uh, like the day after he was sworn in. And here we are. And here we are. But you know, listen. Remember everything that he has pr- proposed. Not that he, he's he's accomplished zero, but everything that he has proposed shows you who he is. You know, all he does is uh, you know threaten to cut taxes for the wealthy on the backs of the poor, threaten to cut Medicaid, the most vulnerable Trump voters there are, and these people did vote for him. West Virginia did vote for him. Ohio did vote for him. Kentucky did vote for him. These are the most vulnerable people on the planet and uh the the senate bill the house bill it takes everything from them when they have so little and it gives it to guys like trump a cornucopia of benefits rolling back tax increases uh you know on the affordable care act so that they can then hand uh you know these breaks over to the people who are best situated it makes no sense to me but you will promise me that you'll find some quality time for Howard over the weekend, won't you? Howard, tell him I'm a good person to live with. <laughs> I'm wonderful, he said. I'm certain that you are. So stop. You're making me feel like, uh, you know, I should actually toil under the belly or something. There's no way. Right here. Right here. <laughs> Tamara in uh, Mississippi. Tamara? Tamara. In Missouri. Missouri. Missouri, yep. Well, hey, Randy, it's a... Uh... <laughs> Terrible week in Missouri. Why? What happened? Well, the voters of Missouri haven't realized they need to stop voting Republican. Okay, first they put through a law that said landlords are allowed to discriminate against women who have had abortions. What? How? How? How would they know? <laughs> they ask. They, they they can ask you on your application if you've had an abortion. Get out of here! That can't be true. Cause it's all medical. True. No. Ask, ask Tom Hartman. He did a thing on it today. I'm he not was, asking anybody because HIPAA <laughs> HIPAA is a privacy act that has to do with your health. You know, with your, your your medical records. You can't ask somebody that. Well, women are the only ones that have abortions, so it's actually sex discrimination in housing, which is illegal. Well, yeah, but I mean, I, I can't even imagine that that, that 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 they could ask that or anybody does ask. That's, that, that's kind of nutty. Number two is they've cut funding for the developmentally disabled that are living in group homes and foster homes and in apartments of their own. The, the more, the ones that are... are that need a little assi- get, assisted living, yeah. Right, but they can actually get on buses and go to a job and, and work. Okay. Well, they've, they've cut the funding so much so that they're going to end up having to house these kids in uh, mental institutions, which are overwhelmingly overcrowded now. Well, you know, it's amazing because... In America, our mental institutions are now prison. Right. So, you know, I mean, I, I don't do we have mental institutions anymore? Do we have them? We do, actually. Deborah Walker 
is the spokesman for state psychiatric hospitals here. Mm -hmm. And she said, we're so full, where would we put them? So they're going to rip these adult, mentally disabled adults, out of their apartments, out of their group homes, and try and shove them into mental institutions, which is what Matt Blunt, who was our governor for one term, who is Roy Blunt's son, Senator Roy Blunt's son. Right. Right. And he got his job when he was Secretary of State. He won the governorship, (laughs) just like that girl down in the 6th District of Georgia. Karen Handel. Yeah, I I mean, listen, why would we want people who are productive in society, who are going, getting on a bus, going to work, doing their thing, contributing to the, the, the community, contributing to the economy, and independently living to be warehoused? Where does this thought process even come from? What is the benefit of that? This has been the dream of the Missouri. Why, though? But why? I mean, obviously you know about this. What is the conversation like? What is the benefit to the community, the society, to the economy, to have them not be living independently, but instead warehoused? What, what, is the, what do they think the benefit there, is? There, it, it just saves a few dollars. On what? It, so they can get bigger corporate taxes. No, no, not for what. What are they saving? I mean, what is the spending that they're trying to save? Because if you put people in in, in an institutional setting, it ends up costing money to put them there instead of earning money to keep them independent. Right, but we have tons of private mental institutions in Missouri. They've been building them everywhere, all over the state. Really? I mean, I I have to look into Missouri. And they're going to get paid to house these kids, young adults, instead of letting them stay on their own and working, well, they're going to house them. That's that's horrible. I, I have to look that look into it. I, I don't know why we closed the show with that uh, particular lovely uh, little slice of heaven. Good. What? With no research? <laughs> that's horrible. It makes no sense to me. That makes no sense to anybody. That that. Uh, okay, don't don't. It just doesn't do me any good. It really doesn't do me any good. Well, have a good weekend, I guess. Buy a stinking podcast. Go to randyroads.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast.